Hello, and welcome to Arcadia University's BI 327 Histology course. And today what we're going to do is take a look at uh, bone as an example of a specialized skeletal uh, connective tissue. As with all of these lectures, it's important that you take a look at the objectives uh, associated with this course. And this will allow you to essentially see what are the important concepts uh, associated with the topic as well as have an opportunity to use these uh, objectives as study focusing questions uh, if they're helpful to you uh, in the process of learning this material. So let's get down to it. Uh, we're going to be looking at bone uh, in today's lecture and so to start out with the general characteristics what we're looking at is going to be a structural component uh, as a specialized connective tissue that's going to be the main component found within the adult skeletal system. And so again, if we think about the bones, uh, the gross anatomical bones of the body, uh, we recognize that they're there for both support, support for the body structure, giving it a, a three-dimensional shape, uh, allowing it to, again, <coughs> excuse me, interact with muscle cells and uh, allow movement. And so we got support in that way, movement uh, when it's combined with muscles. Uh, but we've also got uh, a protective mechanism. Uh, we can take a look at the skull, essentially the bony protective covering around the, the brain. We've got the rib cage as a bony protective covering around many of the vital and internal organs. But we've also got structures within the bone itself, within the bone marrow that we'll be talking about later on, which is surrounded and supported by the bone structure. So it's got a good protective mechanism. If we take a look at the characteristics associated with bone and think about this as that relationship between uh, structure and function, the relationship between anatomy and physiology, what we see is that bone is going to be second to cartilage in its ability to withstand compression. Now cartilage, we said, was essentially like a sponge. You can compress it, you can squeeze the water out, and cartilage will rebound and draw the water back in. Bone is going to be very good at resisting compression, but up to a point. At a certain point, you're going to put enough pressure on the bone and you're going to actually start crushing the bone uh, and at that point, you're going to damage the bone or fracture the bone, uh, and it doesn't have the resiliency that we see with cartilage. Uh, it's going to be second to enamel, the enamel of the tooth, in terms of hardness. So again, we've got this very, very strong protective structure that's very hard, very resistant to damage, very resistant to compression. Uh, and it's going to be those properties that allow it then to be there for both support and for protection of the internal body organs. Again, as we uh, kind of highlighted a couple minutes ago, uh, it's going to form a series of levers and pulleys when we interact the structure of the bone with the structure of the muscles, the anatomical kind of arrangement of the muscles, allowing for the movement of the body as a whole. Uh, again, continuing on with these basic functions of bone, we said it's going to be surrounding, supporting, and protecting fragile tissues and organs. And the example of that is like the uh, the, the skull protecting the brain, uh, the rib cage protecting the, the heart and the lungs, uh, as well as um, protecting the structure within the bone itself, within the bone marrow, where, at least in the adult, we're going to find the hematopoietic tissues, the tissues that are involved with the production of blood system cells, uh, so the production of, of like red blood cells uh, within the, the adult. Uh, and that's a vital property, and it's going to be protected by uh, the, the bone structure itself. The bone is also going to be the storage location for calcium and a variety of other minerals. And we'll talk about that primarily calcium um, as the, the basic properties of the bone, but we'll also talk about it in relationship to some disease process, osteoporosis, osteopenia, uh, later on in today's lecture. Now again, Focus in on bone as an example of a specialized connective tissue. So as a connective tissue, it's going to have the same components of the other generic connective tissues we talked about. It's going to be similar to cartilage uh, in some ways. So think about this as a connective tissue where we're going to have cells, we're going to have fibers, and we're going to have ground substance. Uh, the cells are going to be scattered, and in between them, we're going to have the extracellular matrix, essentially the fibers and the ground substance. Now, when we take a look at the cells within the bone, what we're going to have are primarily osteocytes, os for bone, site for cell. So osteocytes are going to be the primary bone cells. We're going to have osteoblasts, os for bone, blasts for builders, and we're going to have bone building cells. 
And we're also going to have a category of cells that are different from some that we've seen before. We're going to have osteoclasts, class with a C. And these are going to be bone resorption cells. These are going to be cells that are going to be specialized for going through and eroding the bone either as a normal remodeling process or as a mechanism to liberate some of the materials that are found within the bone itself. What makes uh, bone different from the other specialized connective tissues we've talked about before is when we take a look at that extracellular matrix. Now, the extracellular matrix is going to be composed of both organic, essentially uh, organic living uh, produced tissues and, and structures, proteins, things like that, uh, as well as inorganic. Inorganic is going to be a mineral component. And so we'll take a look at the organic components of bone first. The organic components are going to be referred to as osteoid, and it's going to be about 50% of the bone volume and about 25% of the bone weight. And so this is going to be your traditional extracellular matrix that we would see in other regions of the body. So we're going to have fibers, primarily type 1 collagen fibers, and we're going to have a lot of ground substance uh, in there as well. But it's going to be the type 1 collagen that's going to be present within this osteoid, which is going to establish the three-dimensional matrix of the bone structure. And again, if we think about the characteristics of type 1 collagen, it's going to be a very, very strong muscle, uh, I'm sorry, very, very strong tissue. It's going to be resistant to stretch, so it's almost like little uh, steel girders, in essence, within uh, the bone matrix itself. Now, again, what makes bone different from the other tissues of the body is that on top of this organic component, so on top of this osteo, the, the type 1 collagen fibers and the ground substance, we're going to have an inorganic component as well. And it's going to be these inorganic components that are going to be the predominant tissue component. It's going to be contributing to the overall characteristics associated with bone. It's going to give the bone matrix its hardness. So it's going to fill up about 50%, about equal to what we had with the osteoid, but it's going to fill up the rest of the bone volume, but it's going to comprise a very dramatic proportion of the bone weight. It's estimated about 75% of the bone weight. And what we're looking at in these inorganic components are calcium and phosphate. Uh, essentially, they come together in hydroxyapatite uh, crystals, but it's essentially this three-dimensional crystal structure that goes in and is deposited on that osteoid. It's deposited on that organic extracellular matrix, and this crystallization is going to go in, fill the gaps, and even strengthen that type 1 collagen even more. It's going to make it more resistant. It's going to be making it harder. It's going to give it the strength that we would associate with the bone structure itself. Now, in order to study bone, again, if we're looking at the gross anatomical skeleton, you know, we, we're, we're looking at essentially a, a dissected uh, organism. We're looking at the bones that have been exposed. But in order to study this for histology, we need to have a relatively thin slice that we can put on a microscope and we can illuminate. We can shoot a light beam through it and to be able to look at it like we see on the other tissues. With bone, though, we've got something that's incredibly hard. We don't really have the ability to take a piece of bone, normal bone, uh, and put it on our microtome and attempt to cut it. Uh, it's going to be very, very hard, and in essence, if we were to try to cut it, it essentially is going to either damage our knife or damage the tissue itself. Uh, so there are going to be two primary ways in which we can study bone. The first is a process called ground bone, and it's basically you take a piece of bone and you grind it down using like a grinding wheel, uh, or sand it down in essence until you get a very, very thin sliver, a very, very thin slice of the bone. Now, in doing this, we're going to have the solid structure of the bone, but it's going to be a very artificial way of processing the tissue. And so we've got this almost like a, this bony skeleton, and we're taking a piece of it and we're looking at it underneath the microscope. And so we're not really going to see uh, the biological cells. What we're going to see are going to be the remnants of the three-dimensional structure that are present there. So many times when you take a look at a piece of ground bone, it's going to have some dark structures in it because we're essentially going to grind it down to what's very, very thin, and then we're going to put something like India ink on it. And the ink is going to be drawn into uh, the openings and the passageways within the bone, and it's essentially going to stain it in that way. And that's what we see on the left-hand uh, image on this slide. On the right-hand side, we've got the other way of studying bone. And the other way of studying bone is essentially to look at it as a demineralized bone tissue. 
And in essence, what we're doing is we're taking the bone structure that we know is a specialized connective tissue. It's got cells, it's got fibers, it's got ground substance, and then it's got all that inorganic stuff that makes it different from other biological tissue. What we're gonna do in demineralized bone preparation is that we're gonna treat it with acids, and the acids are gonna leach out, they're essentially gonna draw out the uh, inorganic fibers, that hydroxyapatite, the calcium, the phosphate, it's gonna draw out, and what's gonna leave behind are gonna be the organic components. So what you're gonna have are gonna be cells, lots of type one collagen, and some ground substance. So it's essentially the equivalent of like, um, almost like a tendon. We can take a tendon and we can section it. We can take a piece of demineralized bone and we can section it. And that's when we can essentially process the bone tissue and look at it using normal histological preparation, normal hematoxylin and eosin staining that we see on the right-hand portion of the slide. So again, two different ways of going through and studying the bone structure itself. So we're gonna assume that we can study the bone structure and we're gonna uh, look at demineralized bone. So we're gonna look at the bone cells. The bone cells are gonna start out with the osteoblasts. The osteoblast, os for bone, blast for builders, are gonna be the bone, yeah, sorry, the bone forming cells. Uh, you can see these on a surface of bone. So you got the, the kind of pink uh, staining appearance because we've got lots of type one collagen uh, within the bone structure itself. And you're gonna see the osteoblast as cuboidal cells, large nucleus, basophilic cytoplasm, high alkaline phosphatase activity for depositing the calcium phosphate, well-developed rupt endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus, because these are gonna be the cells that are essentially sitting on one, uh, one surface of the bone, and one cell thick layer, and they're gonna be synthesizing and depositing the bone. So you're gonna deposit both the organic and the inorganic components. So the osteoblasts then are gonna be stimulated by things like parathyroid hormone, insulin growth factor one, and they're essentially gonna to start to produce the organic components of the bone. And then things like vitamin D3 is gonna stimulate osteocalcin, osteocalcin is gonna to bind to the calcium phosphate, and it'll allow for those inorganic components to be added to the bone structure itself, to build the bone. Now, once these osteoblasts become terminally differentiated, they're essentially trapped within the bone matrix itself, and they're gonna be found in a region called the lacuna. So similar to what we see with the uh, chondrocytes. So an osteocyte is gonna be a bone cell trapped within the bone matrix. Now bone doesn't have the ability to have diffusion uh, like we would see in the cartilage. So what we have are these osteocytes are gonna be extending out very long, thin philopodia, cytoplasmic processes. They're gonna extend through little canaliculi, little canals within the bone matrix, and they're gonna connect up with other bone cells. And this is gonna allow for them through gap junctions to exchange oxygen, nutrients, uh, exchange waste materials, so that the cells that become in the trapped within the bone matrix are not isolated from the circulatory system. They're not uh, essentially not gonna be starved or, or killed because they, they don't have re access to resources. And then the final bone cells we're gonna take a look at are gonna be the osteoclasts. The osteoclasts are gonna be the bone resorbing cells. These are gonna be a little bit different from the other bone cells we've seen. So they're gonna be very, very large, multinucleated. Uh, so you can see multiple nuclei, anyway from two, and some books describe them as having up to 50 nuclei. So they're gonna be relatively large, very acidophilic cytoplasm because they're gonna have lots of lysosomes, lots of mitochondria, lots of Golgi, because essentially they're gonna be producing these lysosomes and think about what the lysosomes do. They have lots of acids, lots of collagenases. So acids, as we said, in demineralized bone preparation will leach out the minerals. Collagenases will break down the collagen. So the osteoclasts have the ability to essentially break down that bone matrix. Now in doing that, they're gonna sit on a surface of bone and they're often gonna be in a shallow depression on the bone called a house ship's lacuna. And they're essentially gonna sit there, dump out their acids, dump out their collagenases, and allow them then, in essence, to break down the bone material, similar to what we do in the bone preparation of the demineralized bone. Now that's it for uh, the introduction to the basic characteristics associated with bone. Uh, come back for part two in the lecture. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thanks, and I'll see you in part two of this lecture series.